he is just the greatest. He is awesome. He is the ultimate. And I'm excited to be worshiping him with you today. This morning, we're going to do a song that we've, we've done before. We've done it a few times. It's called Glorious Day. Di- uh, not Glorious Day. Bound for Glory. I'm sorry. Bound for Glory. And it's a beautiful song. We've, we've done it before, like I said. And it really just focuses on the fact that this world, you know, we can go through trials and tribulations. We can lose a job. We can lose a loved one. But we look forward to something better and beyond this earth that this earth cannot offer. As Paul says, we are sojourners. We are just passing through. This world is not a place where we should be setting up and getting ready to stay forever because this is not our home. This is like we're our home away from home almost. This is not where we belong. We belong back home with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in heaven forever and ever. And so when we pass from this earth, we're going to go into something better. We don't have to fear sin. We won't have to fear death any longer. We won't have to fear anything of this world because anything of this world, because all we're going to be doing is praising Jesus for the rest of eternity. And I am personally really excited to be praising Jesus in heaven with all of you when we get there. So let's let's come to the Lord and let's get ready to just enter into his presence and worship him with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for this beautiful morning and we just thank you that we're able to come together as believers. We don't have to be distant from you any longer. We don't have to make any more sacrifices. We don't have to fear coming into your presence. As Paul says, we can come into your presence boldly. Come boldly before the throne of grace with whatever problems we have. We have, And we thank you for that, God. And so I pray that your spirit would take over right now. Your spirit would guide us into your presence. And we would just be excited to be with you this morning, Lord. Father, fill this place with your joy, with your love. And I pray you would be honored with our worship this morning. Fill this place right now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen.
is good, isn't he? We're so thankful that you're here this morning, that you've come to worship with us as a family, as the bride of Christ. And let's go to the Lord now and ask that he prepare our hearts for what he wants to do this morning in this place. Amen? Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we come to you with boldness because your word tells us to come boldly to your throne of grace. And Lord, all across this room, there are need after need after need. And people have come here this morning with a broken heart, 
People have come here this morning with shackles that have bound them. People have come here this morning searching and seeking. And Father, I pray that you would show up in this place in such a real way, such an evident way, that we would have no doubt that you visited your people today in glory. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this service. We allow you to take up a, an empty seat and to sit next to each and every single one of us, that you would open your word to us, that you would unsheath the sword of the Spirit and plunge it deep into our hearts. And even though some of us may be here this morning and we're guarding our hearts and we're trying to protect them and we're trying to, to, to keep ourselves from being hurt over and over again, Lord, I pray that we would be vulnerable before your Spirit this morning that we would allow you the space to do what you need to do in our lives, that you would make us the people that you know we can be, that we need to be the believers that we need to be, that you would equip us with the gifts that we need to bring a benefit to your body, and Lord, that you would get glory through what is spoken and through what is the, the praises that are offered, and as we celebrate later on at the Lord's table, that you would get glory because you're worthy, Lord. And so, Father, this is all for you. We've gathered together, the worship team has practiced, they, they, they've rehearsed, we, we've studied the scriptures, we've, we've met to discuss a message. Everyone is here because we want you. And Lord, forgive us if we ever try to find our satisfaction or soothe the longing of our soul in any well that the world would offer. Lord, we want you and you alone. Only you will satisfy. So come and quench the thirst of your people in this place today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you turn around and say hello to somebody? Say good morning. Anybody notice that it got windy as soon as the fair came into town? Yeah, you know, we, we should have them come in and go ahead and have a seat. We should have them come, uh, you know, when it's hot, in the middle of the summer, so that the cool breeze comes and cools things down for a little while, because it always happens this time of year. Hey, this morning, we're going to give the Lord an opportunity to receive our tithes and our offerings, so I'm going to call the ushers forward. And as they're coming forward, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thank you that we have an opportunity this morning to give. Lord, we count it a privilege to give and to sow seeds into the work of your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that you would use the money that your people give faithfully this morning, that you would take it, that you would multiply it, that you would meet the needs not of just this ministry. Lord, the, the, the kingdom of God is so much bigger than Christ Community Church, but that you would meet the, meet the needs of the missions that we support and, and, and the brothers and sisters on the mission field that we support and the orphans that we support. And God, that you would do a work in this community through the money that is collected, that a light would go forth, that hope would invade this community and this culture, and God, that people would be changed for the better because of what Jesus has done in their, in, in their lives, Lord, and that that would be evident through the work of this ministry. And so, God, we give you this time. This is a form of worship as well. Meet us in this place, and during this giving, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as the offering is being passed, take a look at these video announcements. Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the Community Update. This is one of the ways you can prepare to love, live, and lead in your community. Our teen girls will be hosting the Bigger Than Girls Conference. So here's Katie with the Inside Scoop. Hi, my name is Katie, and I'm super excited to announce the second year of our Youth Girls Conference Bigger Than 2019. It's gonna be on March 15th and the 16th, and you guys are definitely gonna wanna check it out. We have a two-day conference jam-packed with main speakers and really awesome workshops, and tickets are only a dollar, so you're gonna wanna get those now because they're going to be $5 at the door. We hope to see you guys all there at Bigger Than 2019. New Creations is celebrating their 25th anniversary, and banquet tickets are on sale now. My name is Walter Tolis, and I am the founder and executive director of New Creations. New Creations is a Christ-centered program for those battling with life-controlling problems. And we're excited this year because we're now celebrating 25 years of ministry. Through the years, we have seen countless people come through those doors. And one of the most beautiful things about New Creations 
is not only seeing a drug addict or alcoholic set free of their addiction and establish a relationship with Jesus Christ because we believe that he's the answer, but we've also seen God restore many families. So in celebration of 25 years of ministry, we're having a dinner banquet on Friday, April 12th. It's gonna be held at the Casa de Mignana building at the fairgrounds. And it's gonna be at 6 p.m. Tickets are $25 a piece. A wonderful time of fellowship, great food, and a joyous occasion of celebrating God's faithfulness through the years. Hope to see you there. It's gonna be a grand evening. We're all about doing life together as we love, live, and lead at Christ Community Church. And the way to keep up with everything that's happening in this busy, busy church is to download the CCC IV mobile app. You can find it in your app store, or there's a link on the cccivorg website. Now there's just one more thing that you need to be made aware of. For as long as I can remember, it's been here. No one knows how it started or why it exists. Only that it happens in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness. Certainly the government has a hand in it. There are stories of an outside world free of its power, but those are only rumors. It robs me of sleep, destroys my routine. Is it this Sunday? Is it next Sunday? Why always on Sunday? Don't they know what happens on Sundays? I can't escape it. After each event, my world is a mess. Is it day? Is it night? Why is the day so much longer? Is it a glitch in the matrix? A collapse of the space-time continuum? The truth is being kept from the world. didn't see that coming. Uh, let's all stand together and continue with our worship service. Uh, today we're going to be doing a song that uh, was introduced last week, um, and it's called Yes, I Will. And something uh, really stuck out to my, so uh, to my heart just as, as I was singing that song and it was being led. It's a beautiful song. But as it goes on, it talks about how I count on one thing, the same God who never fails. Will not fail me now, you won't fail me now. And the chorus goes, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I think that this is a beautiful song because we live in a culture right now that is so fixed on feelings, so fat on, oh, well, well I'm not really feeling it today. I don't really want to do it. But I think it's important for us as Christians that no matter what we're going through, whether it's the most difficult of times, whether we look outside and we're just discouraged by what's going on in our culture, whenever we are just depressed and feeling down, we need to determine in our hearts, oh yes, I will worship the Lord. Oh yes, I will bless his name. Oh, yes, I will keep on doing the right thing because my God is bigger than myself. My God is bigger than my situation. My God is simply bigger than anything else that can come into my life. And nothing will rob me of what the Lord has done in my life. And I will not let my flesh take over what God has done. And so I don't know where you stand in your life right now. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you this. The God that I serve has never failed. He's the one thing I can count on. In this crazy, hectic life, he is the one thing I can count on. So let's worship him together. Lift your hands if you need to. 
Sing in your own heart if you need to. Come to the altar if you need to. Get on your knees if you need to. However you want to worship the Lord. Whether you're going through something or whether you've simply forgotten about God, recenter your life on Jesus today.
sing it out to him. Holy.
You may be seated. Hi, my name is Cameron Colas. I have been the youth pastor here at Christ Community Church for a little over a year now. Since I was a youth pastor and even before that, I started to notice a definite decline in morality in our culture, and not just in our high schools, but you could look around and attest to the same thing. And you know, this shouldn't surprise us. I mean, Paul warns Timothy and, and also us that in the last days there would be hard times. And then Paul goes on to say uh, a list of different sins like lovers of self, lovers of money, being arrogant, proud, and all these different things. But it culminates at the end with there being lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I think that is a definite definition of what our culture is like today. Our culture tells us, you know, pursue what makes you feel good. And in New York, they say cut out the inconvenience of having a child if you want to, even up to the point of birth. Here in California, we see that there is a definite push on the homosexual agenda. And it's such a sad thing to watch that it's being pushed on our children and ourselves. We should know that the things of this world cannot satisfy us either. And so looking through this world, we can know that we look forward to something better. We look forward to true satisfaction, true pleasure in Jesus Christ, not in the things of this world, not in money, sex, or drugs, but in Jesus Christ. So as we go forward and as I continue to preach to these students, I can preach to them knowing that there is definite hope in Jesus Christ that this world can't offer them. How many believe that today? Right? Turn to Daniel chapter 1 as we continue on our series of seasons of suffering. We will be dealing with seasons of suffering through our culture. It's been an amazing series. We've seen some incredible responses. So thankful to God's word. Is speaking to you as you're turning there to Daniel 1. Got a lid problem there with the water. Uh, so uh, there's only six seats, I think, left for the ARC trip if you're considering that uh, during spring break. Uh, Easter break is what I call it, that's what it was originally initiated as. Uh, you can get your tickets out there. Uh, from Julie Gaddis. Are you going to be in the Welcome Center? She'll be in the Welcome Center. Uh, there's 49 people uh, signed up for that that are going. Uh, it's an incredible price, and you will be blessed as we go back to Louisville, Kentucky, and check out the Ark, a life-size uh, model of the Ark and how it would have been in the days of Noah, along with Creation Magazine. I mean, museum. <laughs> All right, Daniel 1. It's been a long day already. I, you know, this year was uh, Carissa's last year for the fair. It was a happy day when we took that lamb to the fair. Uh, the backyard is so much more quiet. Uh, neighbors, I'm sure, a little bit more happy, uh, but we were there all day and uh, night, and it was a wonderful time just to see how Carissa did and some of the others from the church. So I felt blessed to be a part of that. But along with that, it uh, took a lot out of me. So if, if I cut it short today, the message to maybe an hour and ten minutes, forgive me. Okay, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, uh, if you're looking for names for your baby, there's a good list to go through. Uh, <laughs> then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, uh, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of royal family and of nobility, use without blemish and good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language in the, of the Chaldeans. 
the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. And so let's just, Lord, just speak to our heart today. May we leave here different than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. I find and I found one of the biggest struggles for me when I became a Christian was not really the spiritual disciplines. I really didn't have a problem uh, getting into God's word or even the discipline of prayer. I saw the importance of that. I saw the importance of being plugged into community and being in church every time the doors open because I understood the need for each of us to support one another as we sojourn through this world. Uh, we are sojourners, we're exiles, the Bible describes us as, uh, referring to the fact that the world is not our home. We're looking forward to a homeland called heaven one day. And so when I look at some of the things that we do as Christians to grow spiritually, that was not really my struggle. My biggest struggle came in standing against the cultural currents of our society. I found it um, very difficult at times not to compromise my stance with God and to stand on God's truth in light of what was going on at the time in our culture. And that was 27 years ago and very different setting back then. But even back then, I found it very, very difficult. And I'm sure that you find the same thing to be true. Um, you may say, I struggle with Bible study. You may say, I struggle with my prayer life. I struggle to get to church on a regular basis. My life is just filled with this and that. But I'm going to put before you one of the most difficult things that you're going to face as a Christian is not to compromise your convictions, to remain standing on the Word of God in the light of what's happening in the culture because really what you have in Christianity today in this country is not really a pure Christianity. It is more of a cultural Christianity. And that means that Christians, for the most part, by and large, are out in the culture uh, and they tag Jesus on uh, as a passenger in their car. They are not really living out their faith like they should. And that becomes a tragedy because the church begins to lose what it was raised up to be, uh, what God's calling for the church in the world is, uh, the salt and light that we are, the truth that we are to bring to the world. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the church is actually referred to, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it is the pillar of truth. So if the church caves in, the culture's in trouble because it loses any light that it ever had. It loses the lighthouse that God set up in this world. Now, you don't find this in other cultures. If you, I just came back from Thailand. I was also in Laos, which is a persecuted area, especially where I went. And uh, you do not find this dichotomy. Uh, you do not find a Christian living in the culture or so seeped in the culture that he can't even figure out the voice of God anymore. You're either in or you're not. You're either pregnant or you're not. And that's, that's the way it is in other cultures. And that's why China for so often has prayed that persecution would come to the United States. Not because they hate us and not because they want to see us go through some un do um, suffering, but they love us. They know what America has been in that world, they, in that side of the world. They know what, our, our, what we have been, the American church through history has been for China in planting churches, sending missionaries there. So when they say they're pr praying for persecution in our culture, it's not because they don't love us, it's because they want to see us become what God intended us to be. And so there's really a sifting of the chaff and the wheat that takes place in cultures that face persecution and things. But what we're facing today 
and we are constantly challenged by is the culture coming against us and washing away our convictions, washing away what truth of God's word we have in our heart and failing to stand for what God expects us to stand for. And through all of that, if we suffer from one degree or another, which we will, we're going to suffer at times through temptation. We're going to suffer at times broken relationships as a result of it. And we will suffer blowback for our biblical views. You just need to settle that in your heart because God did not call us to be a friend of the world. He called us to be a friend of him. And it's an interesting thing because as being a friend of him and serving him, we find that others find the truth. They find the way. How many of you came to Christ through a Christian who was living in the world who did not look separate? from somebody else that they look different and there was something inside you that said I want what they have because they live different than anybody else I know I did and I had mentors in my life that lived that way and here in the book of Daniel as we get into Daniel chapter 1 we see where Daniel and his three friends are taken captive from Jerusalem from their homeland in Jerusalem they're taken captive into a pagan culture this is a culture that is filled with polytheism, multi-gods everywhere. And they are taken from a, a, a place that really, even though they weren't living for God, they were paying the price of the sins of their parents, as, as most people usually do. When their parents fall away from the Lord, very few children have a chance of growing up in the ways of the Lord. And so uh, they're paying the price of the sins of their fathers as their fathers drifted from the Lord. But even when they drifted from the Lord, they did not deny that there was one true and living God. They're going from that culture into a culture that's filled with many, many, many different gods. And in Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we see them as really heroes of the faith because they epitomize what Christians really should be like. Living in a pagan culture, how do you live that way? And in the New Testament, it actually alludes to their heroism. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verses 33 to 34, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. That was uh, Daniel quenched the power of fire. That was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. So they're included in that litany of stuff that was just read off. And the culture we live in is becoming increasingly more depraved. You need to understand that. When you stack up the culture against the, the Bible, the values that it holds dear to it, compared to the values that you and I hold, it is becoming more and more depraved. And if you want a stitch of evidence for that, just look what the Senate did last Monday when the Democrats voted against saving a baby after it survives a botched abortion. They voted against legislation that would actually offer life-saving services to a baby, they, would, they just stopped it and said, ah, oh, it's an infringement. I heard stuff, infringement on women's rights and things like that. Really? You would let a baby just die. You would let him die after suffering like that. Those are the weakest and they are the easiest to harm in our culture. And God has a heart for the baby. But if you want to know how depraved we're becoming, in Fantasied in, you know, just the, the murder of innocent babies is a stitch of evidence that you could see. So we are not getting any closer to God as a culture. We are getting further and further away. And as we look at our culture, as we see what it's becoming, these heroes like in the book of Daniel become more and more relevant to your life and my life today. And so what I want you to catch this morning is, first of all, you are to live contrary to the culture. You are to live contrary to the culture. The culture will always be in conflict with God. At certain seasons in the life of a country, more 
so then at other times, but it will always be in conflict with, peop- with, with God. The values will always conflict with God. But it is, as His people, as we have been called out of Babylon, as we have been called out of a pagan culture to live for the Lord, we will live a life that is contrary to the culture in many ways. I'm not speaking about the food in the culture. I'm not speaking even about some of the art in the culture. I am speaking about what it holds dear to them. The values and the principles that are embedded in Scripture just are not existent in the culture today. Very, very different. And so as we live contrary to the culture, we see it commanded in both the Old Testament and we see it also commanded in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see it in Exodus 23. In verse 24, it says, You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do. But you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars into pieces. Leviticus 18.3, You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you live, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. In other words, in the Old Testament, God delivering his people from a pagan nation and bringing them into another pagan land. He's saying, you do not do as they do. You do not do as they do. My statutes, my commandments are very different than theirs. And so in the New Testament, we see passages like in John 17, when Jesus said in verses 14 to 16, I have given them your word. Speaking of his disciples and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And what he's saying there is, though you're in the world, you do not live like the world. In 2 Corinthians 6, Uh, 14 the apostle paul writes do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership is righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship is light with darkness first john 2 15 the apostle john writing do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him you see and and this is just a few passages that I, i i could have put the scriptures on a dartboard and thrown blindfolded and you're eventually going to hit after a couple shots passages like this that command god's people to live very different than the culture of this world now our culture pressures us to compromise that's the goal uh because i'll tell you what if people get you to compromise your values they feel a lot better about living the way they're living If somebody acknowledges that there's a God who delivered us a way of living, that means that they've got to bow to the authority of God. And so a lot of times, the culture will get you to compromise your own convictions, your own biblical convictions. And there's four ways that we see in Daniel chapter 1 where where, uh, the culture tries to get us to live contrary to our convictions and gets us to try and compromise our stand with God, our values with the Lord, our convictions that are rooted in the Word of God. The first one is isolation. Look at verse 3 again. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility. Now, these people... Uh, first of all, they're Jews, as you know. Uh, Israel is the land of God's people that they were taken captive from. But they're also of the royal family and of nobility. In other words, they were around the temple. They were around the things of God. They were um, people that were connected to people, even with uh, the temple and where worship took place, that type of thing. And now they find themselves isolated. Now they find themselves removed from all of that and now in a strange land because when isolation takes place, it's easier to get them to do what you want them to do. And this was not uncommon for pagan kings that would take 
people captive. They would isolate them. They would remove them from their homeland. And their goal was to strip them of everything they knew. And we see that even today. If people become isolated from the people of God, they're more vulnerable to compromising their convictions. We know that to be true. It's no secret that many of those who were raised in church, once they get on the college campuses, walk away from the Lord, at least for a season. They go to college, they get roommates that may not have the same beliefs as they do. They interact in the cafeteria with people that may not believe the same things that they believe. They get into arguments about the Bible and just a bunch of stuff. God doesn't exist. Science proves it. And all this stuff, this nonsense that contradicts everything that they were taught about the things of the Lord. But many times the parents believe that that is the source of them walking away from the Lord, that they succumb to some sort of argumentation. And I'll tell you right now, it isn't that that is the primary source. It is the fact that they don't go to church. They remove themselves from God's people. And so the first thing I tell our college kids, when you get to college, if it's a secular university, and even a Christian university today, the first thing you need to do is find a church that's preaching God's word. Because in a church, God's spirit moves in a special way among God's people. And the preaching of God's word is always being preached to dismantle the lies that are coming against the culture. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. So the first step is usually isolations. Re remove them from that that they're familiar with. The things of the Lord, where everything is, their families that, that serve the Lord, stuff like that. But the second thing is indoctrination. Indoctrination, you see that in verses 4 to 5. It says, uh, youths without blemish of good appearance. And that, that sounds a lot like me. No, <laughs> kidding. Use without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Now watch this. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food of the king ate and of the wine they drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Three years, you know, that's what Jesus spent with his disciples training them and teaching them about the king, the ways of, of, of the kingdom. But now we see that they're in Babylon and they are ordered to be under and re-educated in the ways of Babylon. In order to be in leadership there, they were going to have to understand their culture. They were going to have to understand the way they did things, their science, their history, their astrology, and religion would have been a part of their curriculum too. How do the gods operate there? What are the gods all about in that co culture? Uh, our culture indoctrinates people through education, entertainment, and the expectations of our society. And there are many Christians that are unprepared even to face a culture that believes in faith in God is personable, personal, therefore you must keep it private. All religions are the same and offer valid ways to discovering your fulfillment. The purpose in life is to enjoy yourself through finding what makes you happy in spite of it running against the grain of what your family and church tell you. The human person can be reinvented in line with whatever identity someone chooses. And on and on and on. And a lot of Christians are unprepared to face that culture. Colossians says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So indoctrination is a second thing, but then assimilation is big. The culture tries to assimilate people. If you look at verse 5 again, they were trying to get him to eat from the king's table, uh, the, the king's wine, the king's meat, all the delicacies that would come with royal stuff. And... Um, 
they would need to change their minds and their lifestyles to eat that because the violation there was more to do with violating the food laws and the dietary laws that God gave his people in the Old Testament. So in other words, for them to begin to eat at the king's table all the delicacies, they were going to violate the commands of the Lord. That's the problem that they were facing, and they didn't want to do that. The world will always celebrate those who reject their Christian heritage and initial beliefs. All the time you see stuff roll out, you know, reports of movie stars, reports of singers that have made these great albums and everything else, and they use them usually to parade in front of the culture how they were raised in church, and now they walked away from their faith because what they found to be true was absolutely not true, and those are the ones that they usually pick out. And what the church mourns, the world celebrates, and what the world celebrates, the church should mourn. The only way to resist the lure of assimilating into the world is arrest in the love and approval of God. The voice we listen to the most, the Lord cheering on our faithfulness, is what we should be listening to, not the world cheering for our compromising. And whatever voice you listen to, that's what's going to influence your path in life. I mean, really, God should be who we should be approving, seeking to get approval from. It should be the Lord's approval coming from heaven, not man's approval. If we're seeking man's approval, it's always going to end up where you compromise your convictions. And it begins, you start to assimilate back into the culture. Just met with somebody not long ago, and, and um, they were delivered from a life of drugs and alcohol, and um, they started drinking again. And explained to them, it begins that way. You know, they're less and less and less in church. They're more and more and more into the other things. And they begin to drink. And then before you know it, they begin to do drugs again. And the world is always looking, the culture, to assimilate people back into the world. And that's what you got to be leery of. You got to, whose voice are you listening to today? Whose voice are you listening to? The fourth thing is identification. Verse 7, the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Uh, Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. And so... What he was doing, and the brainwashing begins by getting them to lose their identity. They, they renamed them, and the names that they gave them were really after the pagan gods of that culture. Belteshazzar means Bel, protect the king. Shadrach means command of Aku, which is another god in their culture. Meshach, who is what Aku is. Aku is. That, that uh, after the god Aku, Abednego, means servant of Nego or Nebo, and that was the god of vegetation. You see that god pop up in the book of Isaiah. So what the brainwashing began with was to make them lose their identity. Make them lose our, their identity. Confuse them on who they are. And once the confusion begins and they forget who they are, then it's easy. It's easy. They'll be full-blown into Babylon. And our culture is becoming more and more confused. People are becoming more confused as to who they are. It's highlighted, I think, in the gender issue. Confusion is not coming from a name change, but a gender change. This is why we're dealing with the issue of transgender. The state of California um, used to issue driver's license with only an M and an F on it for male and female, and now there's an X meaning that they're not binary, and that, and that if you don't want to identify as a male or a female, you can just identify as X, and it's getting worse and worse. California Department of Education is working on a plan to teach kindergartners that there's at least 15 different genders. One of the recommended books is titled, Who Are You? The Kid's Guide to Gender Identity. It claims to provide a straightforward introduction to gender for anyone aged four plus. 
four years old or over. The book also claims, among other absurdities, that grown-ups make a guess about what gender babies are by looking at their bodies. The cover features a boy in a dress and a girl climbing a tree. This is how it's getting. This is what our culture is. And many Christians buy into it, even though God said he made two genders. He made male, he made female. And yet, Christians just buy into it. And they're, they're, the, the biggest lie is if, if Satan can confuse you about who you are, if you lose your maleness or femaleness and the roles get all confused, what does the culture look like? What is it going to end up like? Now, I believe you need to approach them with love. But it blows me away how many have already bought into this. In spite of what Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Peter 1.14 is obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And people are being squeezed into the mold of the world day in and day out. They're listening to the lies and they're not even filtering it through the truth of God's word. In order to withstand the cultural current that attempts to sweep you away from biblical truth, your convictions must run deeper than the culture. Your convictions must run deeper than the culture. In other words, the roots of biblical convictions must run deep. If the, tri tri if the tree has no roots, then it'll be blown over by the first storms it hit. I was talking to my parents the other day on the phone. They live up in San Diego, and they said, we've never seen weather like this before. It's raining a lot, and the trees are being blown over, and we've just never seen this. And she said that the roots, you see the roots of the trees when they blow over, how shallow they are. But, but, but that's like biblical conviction. That it, it has to run deep, and you have to know that the heart is the core of our conviction. The heart is the core of all of our convictions. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuch to allow him not to defile himself, so to participate in those food law, food, those delicacies, no matter how good the steak looked or the pork looked, he was going to violate those convictions of his which would have done damage to the conscience, which would have wore down his biblical convictions completely. But that word for resolve literally means he purposed in his heart. In other words, it was already in his heart. He purposed in his heart not to defile himself. Oh, that's pretty amazing because everything does begin in the heart. We know that Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. In other words, what Proverbs is saying is that your heart is a well where all of life springs from. Imagine a well that you, you go and, you know, it's a hot day and you're thirsty and you, you get a, a drink of water and you just say, wow, that well is just, the water is just so clean and crisp and refreshing. You would never, ever think of polluting that well. You would never, ever think of purposely throwing stuff in there to pollute the water. You would want to keep it pure. You would want to keep it clean. But when you buy into the lies of our culture, that's what you're doing. You're polluting the well where your life flows from. It all begins in the heart. You cannot underestimate a word. Proverbs says there's the power of life and the power of death in our words. And once you start believing, once you start buying into it, and you're in trouble, and Daniel refused to. He said, I pur he purposed in his heart. The Bible says he purposed in his heart. He was going to keep himself from that. 
And convictions are cultivated. They just don't happen overnight. Convictions don't happen overnight. They, they, they just don't. They, they, a tree never establishes roots quickly. The roots grow deeper and deeper over time of watering, over time of fertilizing. And I'll tell you what, parents, if you are not instilling convictions, biblical convictions in your kids' hearts right now when it comes to real life, they're not going to develop them overnight. They just won't. It takes time. This is why it's so important to prepare your children for the cultural war through diving deep, deep, deep into their hearts. Drive it deep into their hearts, the biblical convictions. Daniel and his friends, they were trained by parents who loved the Lord. And you say, how do you know that? Look at what their names reveal. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. Mishael means who is like the Lord, and Azariah means the Lord is my helper. Their names tell you something about what their parents believed in. And so when they got to Babylon, it wasn't that they just learned to stand for the Lord then. Their entire life, they were being trained and raised in the things of the Lord. One of the mistakes that we can make as parents is not to train up our children in the ways of the Lord. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, both Old and New Testament. The New Testament, we know that Timothy's life was a living example of this because of what Paul, his mentor, said about him. In 2 Timothy 1.5, speaking of Timothy, he said, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. In 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And how your child, from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy is an example of that best thing you can do is teach them what it means to stand on God's word. You can't teach them a cultural Christianity. You can't teach them a Christianity that says we go to church on Sunday, but we live like the world on Monday. You can't teach them a cultural Christianity that says the Bible is the word of God, then but treat it like it's a comic book. You just can't do it. You have to live out God's word or they pick up on the hypocrisy. When parents don't cultivate biblical convictions, it becomes a disaster. You can see it in the life of Eli, who was a high priest in the Old Testament and he served in the tabernacle where God's presence dwelt. And even though he was serving the Lord and even though he was ministering in the tabernacle, he didn't raise his kids in the ways of the world. And here's what 1 Samuel chapter 2 says, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. He was a high priest. He was the top dog at the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And that's where God's presence dwelt in the Old Testament. Later on in the temple, God's presence would dwell in a powerful, powerful way. And yet he would be serving the Lord and giving of his life as a sacrifice to the Lord. And then we read in the Bible that his own sons were worthless men, that they did not know the Lord. Yeah, it's true that kids can grow up all around us and not know the things of the Lord. And I'll tell you what, when they get too old, it's hard to change them. Kathy Truitt, who was the founder of Chick-fil-A, he said it's easier to raise a child than to change a man. You have to make sure you're teaching your kids true Christianity. What does it mean to hold to God's word? How do we respond towards all the cultural issues that are coming our way? And the last thing I want to say is don't compromise regardless of the consequences. You and I know that we're going to receive some sort of blowback 
If we're living out our faith in a culture that is anti-God, we're called to fear God, though, more than the consequences. Turn to chapter 3, and I'll show you this. I'm not going to recount the entire story on what takes place with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we talked about really how their names really reflected what their parents thought about God, knowing that they were raised in the things of the Lord. And then when the true test came of where their faith was, we see it in chapter 3 where King Nebuchadnezzar, they just didn't have multiple gods there in Babylon. They had tons of gods in Babylon. In other words, any god you wanted to serve, you can serve. But that wasn't enough because Nebuchadnezzar had a case of pride, the big head. He wanted people to worship him, so he built a statue that is 90 feet tall. It's 9 feet wide. It's 90 feet tall. And he gathers together all the the leaders, all the, the governors and what would be senators and congressmen. He gathers all the leaders of the country together, and this is what they're going to do on the day of dedication. The minute the music starts to play, you ought to read that sometime, by the way. If you don't think music influences people, you ought to read that because music does have an influence. And I'm telling you, parents, that for a reason, because some of your kids are listening to gangster rap. They're, they're listening to music about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and we think that they can handle that, and they can't. Music is very, very powerful, and Nebuchadnezzar uses it here in chapter 3. He says when the music plays, everybody's going to bow down and worship this image of me. Okay? That was the command. So he gets everybody together, day of dedication, statues there, the music strikes up, and people bow to worship him. Now, we don't know where Daniel was at this time. He could have been on a business trip. He's not here. The only ones here is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, the three other Hebrews. We we look at the book of Daniel, and we see that it's primarily about Daniel. But here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are cut out of the same cloth as Daniel. And so, once the music starts, you're going to bow and you're going to worship. So the music starts, and the problem is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down and worship. When God first delivered the people out of Israel and he brought them to Mount Sinai and he was going to make them a holy nation, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And the first two commandments are the most important because if you lose on the first two, everything else is worthless. Commandment number one, you shall, not, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And so they knew that. And they said, under no circumstances are we going to violate that. We don't care who Nebuchadnezzar is. And then here's where the pressure comes. Look at verse 13. You always have people... who want to wreck other people's lives. And in verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed, they're bringing the news to Nebuchadnezzar, over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Okay, there's the news to the king. Now, Here's the king's response, verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, he's got a full band there and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And I like this part. Nebuchadnezzar closes with, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? 
That's the pride that's going on in him. What God can deliver you? What God can deliver you? Now, you got to admit, <clears throat> you and I have faced pressure in the past to cave in on our convictions. But none of us were brought before a fiery furnace. And none of us were facing the threat of being burned alive if we didn't worship the image. But they were. And you have to ask yourself, you have to stop in the story and you have to put yourself in the story. And you have to say, if that was me, what would I do? What would I do? If that was me, it's so easy just to say and to bow down. But to them, their convictions ran so deep, it would be so blasphemous before a holy God who they knew in a personal, intimate way and who they did not want to offend by living out his commandments. So they lived them out. So, here's what happens. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, have you ever seen that game show? It was uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And then they would give an answer, right? And the, 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 the host on the show would always say, is this your final answer? And then every now and then, somebody would, you know, they're so sure of their answer, they don't even let the host ask them. You know, they just say, this is my answer, and that's my final answer, before he says, is this your final answer? That's how sure they were of the answer. And so what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say is, we don't even, this is our final answer. We don't even need to talk about this. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. That's who they know God to be. But here's what I like, because the word of God included this. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. In other words, we don't serve God because he'll deliver us. We serve God because of who he is. I see people all the time that they'll come to church, my marriage is a disaster, and if their marriage don't get fixed, they're gone. If, if God doesn't pull through with them on some sort of issue, they're gone. And you have to ask yourself, do I serve God because of what he does for me, or do I serve God because of who he is? We all have to come to that resolution like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if God didn't pull through, I will not serve other gods because he's a true and living God. And that's what we have to stand within the culture today. That's our final answer to all of that. Your children can become a God in your life. There's so many things in our lives that we bow to that we don't even realize. Sports can be a God in our lives. It's obvious by the salaries that they're getting today. $340 million for a baseball contract. Money, power, prestige, achievement, guns, national security, automobiles, sex, work, phones, materialism, success. Just to name a few gods that people bow to in this culture. And when the word idol comes to somebody's mind, they're thinking like archaic that there's some statue out there that they're bowing to. They never think in... Facebook. They never think of Instagram. You know what an idol is and a false god? It is anything that steals your time and attention that belongs to the Lord. It's anything that steals your resources that belong to the Lord. It's anything that takes your life out of you. And genuine faith will always fear God more than anything else. And that's what we see in the life of of, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in verse 18. 
It highlights the fact that they feared God more than anything else. It wasn't anything other than God themselves. They had a healthy fear of Him. And fire always tests our faith. I'm skipping over stuff, Angel, so you know. Um, fire will test our faith. Fire will test our faith. You may not face a literal fire, but we face the fire all the time with the Lord. There's things that we always face when we wake up every single day. We face things that may not be a literal fire, but they are a fire nonetheless. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7, it says, In this you rejoice, though for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that testing genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though it test, be tested by fire. It may be found to the result of the praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, our faith is a faith that can't be trusted unless it's tested. No different than gold. The only way to know where your faith is with God is when it's tested. It's the only way. It's the only way. And then when it's tested, you know where it stands. And what Peter's saying is that when the fire comes, when it's heated up, then you know whether it's genuine faith or whether it's not genuine faith. You understand? In other words, if I sold you this ring, how would you know it was gold? How would you know it's not fool's gold? It's only when it's put under the test, the acid test. And then we know where our faith stands. And if it's genuine faith, it's always found to the praise and glory of God. Just like here. When Daniel gets thrown in the den in chapter 6, he refused to quit praying. He said, I don't care what the laws of the land say. I'm still going to pray. And he's thrown into the lion's den. His faith was found to be true because it was tested. Just like Timothy's was. I'm going to close with this scripture because when it comes to suffering through our culture, we must remember that our home is in heaven and not on earth. That you and I don't live for the things of this world, we live for the things of the next world. Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christians, we don't live here. We do and we don't. Our citizenship is not here. Really? We're aliens. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And you're going to find in your Christian faith, you're either going to be a conformer or you're going to be a transformer. You're either going to be a, a thermometer or you're going to be a thermostat. See, a thermometer, all a thermometer can do is record the temperature in a room. But a thermostat can t change the temperature in a room. The other day it was 75 degrees in the house and Griselle says you cannot turn on the air conditioner until we hit May. <laughs> I, keep telling her, I keep telling her, honey, listen to me. Air conditioners were not designed for months of the year. They were designed for temperature. It doesn't matter what month. If it's January and it's 100, no. You don't turn on the air conditioner until it's May. Well, when she went to the store, I turned on the air conditioner and it went from 75 degrees down to 70. She's in uh, Brawley today leading worship. <laughs> so don't tell her. Okay, I can trust, right? Everything stays in the room. <laughs> yeah, right. But listen to me. That's what we're called to be, right? We're called to be uh, not thermometers. We're called to be thermostats. When we walk into a culture, we're to change the culture, right? We're not going to read the temperature of the culture. We're going to change the culture. And that's what Daniel and his three friends did. They turned heads through their stance against a culture because their faith was genuine and the proof was in the pudding when it was tested. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Daniel and his three friends. And maybe there's some Christians here this morning that are struggling. <clears throat> I 
in their walk in this culture. If their convictions have been washed away, that they knew where they once were with you, but because of some of the lies of the culture, they've traded their convictions for that. Lord, may we be a people that stands on your word because your word is the source of truth. And when we do that, the light breaks through. So those here today, as we participate in communion, Lord, may it be a time of reflection, but also a time of renewal where we would recommit to the things of God. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you Reflect as the communion is handed out and get things right with the Lord. This is a time of renewal. It's not just a ceremony. It is the Lord's Supper where we examine our hearts and see where we're at with God. And then reminded that our salvation is based upon Him. So as the ushers are coming forward to hand out the communion, This, as they hand out the communion, I've asked them to do just instrumental, not singing. After we participate in the Lord's Supper, we can sing. But at this time, I feel that it's important that you reflect because that's what it says in 1 Corinthians 11, that we're to examine our hearts. We're not to partake of the Lord's Supper in disdain, but we need to sit and reflect so please be seated and as they hand out the communion we can reflect on where we're at with the lord maybe there's sin in your life that needs to be confessed maybe there's things that you've been struggling with that you need to give up to the lord this morning and so they're just going to play instrumental and you can sit there and reflect as they're handing out the communion we'll prepare our hearts to receive of the lord's supper and then at the end, we will close with singing.
so grateful for the Lord's Supper. I know that I need to be participating in the Lord's Supper with all of you on a regular basis. I realize that we live in a culture that's anti-God and that sometimes we don't bat a thousand. That sometimes I know people that have been swept away with the culture and God has swept them back into the church. And the Lord's Supper becomes important to them because they're reminded that it isn't their works that get them to heaven. It's their faith in the one good work that Jesus did on the cross so that when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are also reminded that we're tethered to heaven through the cross of Christ and His work. And the proof is the resurrection. So when we participate in the juice and in the, the, the bread, we're, we're, we're reminded of His body that was broken for us. We're reminded of His blood that was shed for us and that our faith resides in that for the payment of our sins and the fact that we can live now in resurrected power because He rose on the third day. Amen? So wherever you're at, and and listen to me, the culture doesn't even understand this. The culture to them thinks this is just a ceremony. That this is just a ritual as if maybe the Native Americans go through their own rituals out on the reservation. That this is just a part of our... This, it's more than that. This is a very significant thing in the life of a Christian because it talks about our sanctification, our continual movement towards heaven. We need to be reminded that God's grace is a fountain for those who have believed in Him. That when we wake up in the morning, there's a fountain of grace that flows from what he did on the cross to bring you into a right relationship with God. Amen? So let's pray. Lord, as we come to you and we've had this time to reflect this morning on our own hearts and our own lives, that we know our hearts, Lord. We know how wicked we could be. We know how evil our thoughts could be. We know how much we've offended you, Lord. But yet, you know our hearts even more. You know even more, Lord, the depths of our heart. And even when we do good, you know when our motives are wrong, when they're for selfish reasons. And you knowing everything about our hearts, Lord, you invite us to your table to the Lord's Supper, so that we can be reminded that no matter what sins we've committed, you have paid the debt in full. We don't take this lightly. We don't see it as cheap grace, for it was most costly to the Father and to the Son. So as we approach this, Lord, we don't trample on the blood. We don't disdain the body of Christ. We look at it with a holy record. Thank you, Lord, once again as we participate in remembrance of what you did for us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul said on that I delivered unto you that which was delivered unto me that on the same night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, when he had taken bread he broke it and gave thanks and he said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner after supper when he had taken the cup he said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood for as often as you drink it you do so in remembrance of me For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. Amen? The Lord is coming again now after reflecting and after participating in the Lord's Supper, we can sing what was played on the piano. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee.
Well, if you guys would like to continue with our worship, we are going to play a couple more songs. But if you have children that you need to go and pick up, we encourage you to do so and bring them back so you can worship with us.